what is going on here? I, I mean, this looks... I, I hardly dare say it, but this, this looks good for short. Yes, he's, played, he's played it, he's played he's it. Way! There we go. Fantastic. This is surely time Aaron to Kaspar resign. Harry Kaspar has resigned. Yes! 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 Well done, Nigel. Celebrations all round on Tuesday as Nigel Short chalked up his first victory of the match. Reducing Gary Kasparov's massive lead wasn't the issue. It was a psychological blow which should have had greater repercussions. Good afternoon once again from the Savoy Theatre at the end of week six of the Times World Chess Championship. After 18 games, Gary Kasparov needs just one more point for the ultimate prize. Victory and more than one million pounds that goes with it. Nigel Short seemed to have no chance at the start of the week after the champion's best win so far in game 15. But the challenger's epic victory raised everybody's hopes and seemed fleetingly to disturb the champion's equilibrium. Unfortunately, Nigel could not maintain the pressure. With me to look back on a momentous week, Grandmaster Raymond Keane together with author Tony Buzan. Now, no matter what happened after Tuesday, Tuesday was a great day, was it not, Ray? It was absolutely fabulous. And by coincidence, we were absolutely flooded with illustrious visitors that day. Even Lord Callaghan, the former Prime Minister, was here. It was just extraordinary. We were celebrating way into like 3 o'clock in the morning, drinking champagne. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> Even as though he'd won the championship. Well, it felt like game, that. Yes, yes, it felt like, you know, short of one and we all go home. We had a new British world champion. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be. However, we'll also be talking to Ruth Sheldon in this programme, the world's leading under-14 girl chess player. And Daniel King will be here as well with another of his classes. But first, a quick reminder of the main stories this week, beginning with Game 16. After a crushing defeat in Game 15, Nigel Short's challenge for the World Chess Championship seemed over. Gary Kasparov, the reigning champion, leading by six points. Unbeaten so far, his invincible heir had become reality. But Nigel's fighting spirit shone through just when most people thought it had been extinguished. A glorious first victory in Game 16 surprised everybody. The relief was spontaneous and genuine, a major psychological breakthrough worthy of celebration. I think I'll, I'll have a glass of wine. <laughs> G'd up by his unexpected victory, Short's confidence was restored and he rocked the champion again in game 17. In spite of his huge lead, Kasparov was struggling. The champion forced into a corner for the second game in a row. But this time, Nigel was unable to force a win. The game drawn, but yet again, the Russians showing weaknesses where previously there had been none. First, I wanted to see you know, what was prepared. I mean, I like the position and, uh, you know, Maybe Scotch is the wrong choice in London, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Game 18 was Nigel's chance to round off the week in superb style, to continue his renewed attack on a faltering champion. Playing white, another short victory seemed a realistic possibility. Another defeat for Kasparov for so long unbeatable and the match would have been red hot, but it wasn't to be. Short's inspiration vanished as mysteriously as it had appeared two games before. He never really threatened. Another draw and the Russian now just one point from victory. How long can Nigel Short delay the inevitable? Well, the best week so far for Nigel Short in this match, but it may well have come too late. Let's go back now to his day of glory on Tuesday, short, plain white. Now, game 16 began with the Nidorf variation of the Sicilian defence and looked as if it would end in a slow draw. However, things took a turn for the better when Nigel Short offered an exchange of queens. Let's pick the game up now with Kasparov making his response on his 25th move. Kasparov decided to decline the exchange, and from this point, Short had the advantage. All he needed to do was to drive it home. Let's move on to Short's 36th move, Ray Keane and Daniel King commentating.
Ah, he's taken something. He Short rook it. takes pawn on b5. This is getting very tense, very exciting. Will Kasparov play the wild? Queen takes pawn on h2 check. Would he just increase the pressure on the king so with queen to f4? Or would he push on with pawn g4 to g3? All of these moves are possible. Which one will he choose? This is becoming very exciting indeed. It's fantastic in this game how Kasparov has totally ignored his own weaknesses on the Queen's flank. He's just pretended that Short doesn't exist and as, just ploughed as in, on. As indeed Short has just ignored Kasparov's attack. Yeah, absolutely, they're, yes. They're, they're both ploughing on. But Kasparov regardless. doesn't look very happy. He's shaking his head. He doesn't look at all happy. But surely he must move the Queen in here. His Queen's attacked. I mean, it this looks like the only square it can go to. But then maybe we can play the move pawn g2 to g3. Ooh, no, I don't no? think so. I mean, no? then, then I can open up the g file. Yes, that would be bad Queen. because the, 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 after you take on f3, the, the, the pawn on g3 is pinned by the black rook on g8, and that simply wouldn't work. So the queen can come to f4 now. What about short? Can't can't really continue his attack for the time being. But there are so many ideas for Short yeah. in this position, so many attacking ideas. And also, Short is not, at the moment, short of time. He's got four moves to make in 12 minutes, and that is not serious time pressure. Kasparov down to... Ooh, almost, he's down to just about five minutes, and he has five moves to make. So Kasparov in, in a bit of time pressure. Maybe after Queen F4, Queen E5 to F4, you just play Queen takes pawn on H4. Queen takes pawn on H4. Can he get away with that? Then I play, and I can't take on F3. No, you can't take on F3. And meanwhile, there's a, there's a spectacular threat, actually, after Queen H4, is to play the rook on B5 to F5. Ooh, beautiful. Which might well give White a decisive attack. Ah! Oh! play D5. I don't believe it. So if short How can you play a move like that. So if short takes this pawn, opening up the line to the to the queen. What is he doing? Maybe he then wants to play queen takes h2 check. What is he doing? This looks incredible. Short can't have. So so why can't short just take this pawn off? If yeah, short takes indeed. the pawn here, opening up the line of the rook towards the queen. This is amazing. What is he up to? It's an extraordinary move. I'm afraid I'm completely baffled but by he, that. He could Short looks very relaxed. Short doesn't look particularly worried at all. Mildly puzzled, but not worried. Now Kasparov does not look happy. So what is going on here? I, I mean, this looks... I, I hardly dare say it, but this, this looks good for Short. Why, why can't Short simply take on d5, opening up the line of the rook towards the queen? It looks very, very strong. It looks murderous. He must be going to play queen as h2 check then. He must do. Queen takes h2 check, <coughs> king h2, g3 check. King, let's, can we see this on the screen? Pawn takes pawn on d5. Queen takes pawn queen h2, h2 check. King takes, takes g3 check. Winning back. Yeah. Takes on f2 check. King well, takes. Okay, we go, we're going very far down the line, but basically after this move, Kasparov can play queen h2 check, temporarily giving up his queen, but this seems to end up in a position which is, well, it's a, it's a clear pawn up for short. But th there must be other possibilities. How about... Well, there's, there's knight f5 check, again, the move you suggested earlier, Ray. So if pawn takes knight, pawn takes then pawn, pawn takes pawn, and then, pawn and then the opens up the line. Yes, and the, 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 uh, the, the bishop is no longer working from a8 down towards g2, as the black pawn on d5 blocks it. So knight f5 check is certainly a candidate But move. after knight f5 check, what can I, ex do? I expect the king must come back. To e8. Yeah. e8 is the only square. Because otherwise, you, if he goes to f8, you have queen c5 check. And if you go to d8, you have queen to b6 check. But, can but we see now, that? short has excellent possibilities. Knight f5 check, king back to e8. Then... Then you take on d5. Aha. Mamma mia. That's also possible. But, because but why not... I mean, you could possibly just swing your rook over. 
Can he just swing the rook over and attack the bishop? And Certainly not Black's bad. king looks extremely, well, inconvenienced. <laughs> Let's keep our eyes fixed on Nigel's clock. He's got four moves to make in nine minutes. Not time trouble at all, even though he's glancing nervously at the clock. <laughs> this is not time trouble. I say it again, it is not time trouble. Nigel, can you hear me? This is not time trouble. Nigel supporting his head with his hand in seems, case it seems falls off. Seems to be uh, blocking out your comments there, yeah. Ray. No, he's supporting his head with his hand in case it falls off, like Tchaikovsky. You know, Tchaikovsky used to compose, used to conduct holding his head in his hand in case it fell off. This is a moment of crisis. It's an historic moment. So Short has a critical Nigel, dis Nigel decision must, to make. Must yeah. be, this is objectively a winning position for Nigel Short. It must be. Oh, don't say it. Don't say it. And he's played... He's taken on h4. A move we hadn't considered... Uh, well, we had considered it, haven't we? We had thought of that. Queen says h4. It looks like a good move as well. So that if Kasparov catches on f3, on f3... You just take back with the knight. Knight comes back, takes it, attacking the queen. And now the queen in excellent position. It's pinning black's knight, so the knight oh, can't this move. Is, this is over, because white, white is now threatening pawn f3 to f4. And when black takes it, you have pawn e4 to e5, winning and pinning the knight on f6. So Kasparov, with great problems here, the actually, knight... Is actually, I think Kasparov's going to resign. The knight is pinned to the king, and he has great problems dealing with that. I think Gary Kasparov is going to resign. I don't think he's going to move here. I think this is a completely clear position. There's no counterplay, there are no complications, and Nigel's got stacks of time. Nigel Shaw is about to score his first win. Don't say it! We're tempting fate. Well, I, I'm going to take a bet on this. I'm going to bet. You want to bet? Nigel's going to win this game. No. See? No, See? no more bets. Bets off. See? Bets off. <laughs> Nigel looks supremely relaxed. Apart from the, the nervous mumbling. No, I think he's just got dry lips. I think, I think this is fine. Actually, Gary looks remarkably unruffled for someone who I think is about to resign the game. I don't see what Kasparov can do. I actually don't see what he can do. Well, I would be if I, if I had a six-point cushion. Yes. I mean, this is not going to affect the result of the match, but it's finally a really good game by Nigel Short. Uh, I don't see any defence at all to this plan of F4 and E5, do you? I don't, no. It, lo it looks absolutely fantastic. I think the world champion has gone too far. And meanwhile, back at the ranch, you're also threatening pawn E4 takes D5. So, Kasparov's great problem is that he's in this lethal pin. The knight cannot move because the king will be in check from the queen. So what Short is going to try to do is remove black's queen from this square and then the pawn will come down, white's pawn. Oh, he's played a move. He's, he's offering the exchange of queens. What, a, what an amazing thing to do when you're two pawns down. But... I wonder, can Short play knight f5 check here? Absolutely, absolutely. Now, is that a killer? I think it must be. Knight f5 check looks he must, fantastic He must play me. pawn takes knight. So knight f5 check, pawn takes knight. Pawn takes pawn, discovered check from the rook on e1 to the black king. And then the king's only got one move that's sensible. That's king to f8. And then you simply play queen, queen takes, takes knight, knight on f6 with the deadly threat of rook b8 check and checkmate. This must terminate the game immediately. So knight f5 check. If pawn takes knight, then we can open up the line of the rook towards the king. It looks lethal. So the channel 4 commentary team suggestion here is knight d4 to f5 check. Knight f5 check. So if the king moves back, then we have queen, queen takes, takes knight. knight. Well, you actually have rook b8 check as well. Yeah. And if pawn, pawn take, takes knight, pawn then takes pawn, pawn takes pawn check. Discovered check. He oh, can't... He can't well, what can he do? He, if he goes to, to d6, it's queen takes f6 check. If he goes to d8, it's queen takes f6 check. So it's king f8 and then queen takes f6 with the murderous threat of rook to b8. Yes, he's played, he's played it. He's played he's it. Done Way! It. There we go. Fantastic. This is surely time to Aaron resign. Aaron Kasparov's resigned. Yes. 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 yes! Well done, Nigel. They can't believe it. The audience has gone wild. There they go. A packed hall. Savoy here. They're going crazy.
Complete delight in the audience with this historic win. Nigel Short earning one full point. Kasparov still with a five-point lead, but somehow no longer invincible. Uh, it's a relief. A relief? <laughs> More than that, surely. I think it's uh, not before time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mind, you, not it before time. mind you, it took Kasparov 32 games to win a world championship game, yeah. so I'm uh, twice as quick. Nigel Short, not surprisingly, looking very happy there after his first win of the match on Tuesday. Now, Ray, we've had time to analyse the games since then. Um, what are you going to show us here? Well, this is an absolutely critical position. And it's the position after White's 26th move, Nigel's 26th move. And it was Kasparov's move here, Kasparov black to play. And this is where he put his queen on e5, which got him into difficulties. And what he'd been planning to play all along was to play this pawn here to attack the knight. Mm -hmm. That was his idea. And when he got to the position, he realised that there was a diabolical trap here. And the trap goes like this. Rook here. Now, you can't put the queen here because the knight would go into e6 check, discovering an attack on the on black the queen. queen. So after this rook attack on the queen, the queen's got to go right back there. You put the knight in here, queen hits queen check, and you take back. Now if you play bishop takes knight, the rook comes in, and all black's pawns are very weak. So Kasparov had planned this move, rook to c8, but then he saw that this failed miserably to this very neat tactical trick, knight takes pawn. And the point is, if you play rook takes rook, the interposition knight takes rook check wins for white. A Zug, an in-between move, a sandwich move. And if you play pawn takes knight, they're not, as some newspapers are given, rook takes rook. But the rather more subtle move, rook takes rook check, completely decimating Kasparov's position, taking him out totally. And when Kasparov realized he'd missed this, then he started to fall apart. OK, well, thanks very much for the time being, Ray. Join us, uh, joining us in the studio again today, the author of the Mind Map book and president of the Brain Foundation, Tony Buzan. Now, Tony, I want to talk to you about the idea of mental training. What can people do to improve their mental capabilities, if anything? A number of things. Um, the brain is a very flexible and nurturable organ. So a number of principles. Number one would be to make the brain your hobby. I mean, it is a thing that we all carry around with us. We have to use it every day, so use it well and obey da Vinci's principles within that. And da Vinci had uh, four principles for developing a really good brain. Number one was study the science of art. Two, study the art of science. Three, develop your senses. He said we look without seeing, taste, with, you know, eat without tasting, touch without feeling. So he said develop the senses. And fourth, realize that everything connects to everything else. That's number one. Number two would be play chess or some other mental game like Go, like Bridge, and to attend events like this and watch programs like this. There's a thing in sports psychology called the Wimbledon effect. At Wimbledon, everybody's tennis game gets better. Now, in chess, it's the same. People watching these programs and coming to the events get better at chess. I went home, having never beaten my computer in the Sicilian, after watching Nigel and Gary play the Sicilian, and wiped it out. So, so attend these kind of things. Number three, interestingly, is listen to classical music. A study in the classical music. Classical music. Mm. A study in California showed that when people had listened to Mozart and then took an IQ test, their IQ went up six to seven points. So classical music, just listening, activates the brain and makes it more intelligent, more alert. The next one is to map your mind, and that, that literally means mind map. So when you're thinking or taking notes, instead of just using words or just using numbers, use images and colors and association, and you get networks of thought which actually accelerate your thinking processes. Next is to, to become mentally literate in the sense of developing your memory skills, your creativity skills, your reading skills, your learning skills, study skills. Take up new subjects to stimulate the brain. Next, very, very importantly... There's a lot to do, Tony. <laughs> but it's all fun, yes. <laughs> which is really important, is mensana incorpore sano. Healthy mind, healthy body. Get the, the body fit and the mind follows, as indeed both uh, Gary and Nigel have done. And lastly, do something like join the Brain Club. It's an organization for anyone with a brain who wants to learn how to use it, or indeed Mensa for the high IQ. And of course, anybody can develop a high IQ. So elements of those you should do one step at a time. Obviously, you yes. can't do all of it yes. all at once. I mean, you can join the Brain Club and then start to do all the other things, start to play chess and do all the other things. It's not in that order. It's all 
as a, as a lovely menu and just right. keep developing it. It gets better and better. All right. For the time being, thank you, Tony. <laughs> yes. After the break, Game 17, more analysis from Ray Keane, a chat with Daniel King and Ruth Sheldon from Manchester, the girls' world under-14 champion. We'll see you in a couple of minutes. Game 17 on Thursday began with Nigel Short looking confident and Kasparov looking tired. Surprisingly, Kasparov, playing white, played the Scotch opening with which he'd only managed to draw earlier in the match. The middle game was taken up with a lot of manoeuvring, so let's pick it up now with Short's 24th move. Short offered a bishop sacrifice, taking Kasparov by surprise. He moved his bishop to f2 and suddenly the game was alive. Kasparov then made his reply. So Kasparov absolutely must play king takes bishop on f2. He's played it. He doesn't, uh, doesn't like it though. You can see by, by the look on his face. I know it was extraordinary. It's, it's usually when a sacrifice is made. It's a sacrifice against something. You sacrifice a piece on a, on a square that's occupied. But to put a, a bishop on a square that's totally empty Sacrifice a piece on an empty square is one of the rarest operations in chess. It's a fantastic idea. It's a very actually. clever move. The idea is simply to deflect the king that was here from where it's protecting this pawn. So the king had to move away. It's like a deflecting move. And now Short's cook, rook may come down and capture the pawn on h2. Checking the king. The king must come back, must keep protecting the bishop. And then Short can give up uh, his rook. Yeah. Well, um, well I think we're gonna, we, we'll see this in a moment. I don't it's, see it's this. It's going to happen. We don't, we don't Kasparov need. has no alternative. It's going to happen quickly. Too. Rook takes pawn on h2, check. King it slips back. And now we're going to see rook on e4 takes the bishop on e2. It's a fantastic combination by Short. I mean, to get Kasparov caught like this, to trap the world champion like that, but this is the product of Short's extra self confidence induced by his win in the last game. Look at Kasparov hunched over the board. Hesitating for a minute. Rook takes bishop. There he goes. Double rooks on the seventh rank. Threatening checkmate in just a few moves. Kasparov must take that rook. rook. And now the rook on h1. Coming to h1. Check. Rook comes down. Checking the king. The king must move up. Here we go. Yep. Up goes the king. And now rook takes rook. And on now b1. rook takes rook. So Short has recovered all his sacrifice material. And if we take a body count, we can see that Short is now a whole pawn up. Or will be a whole pawn up in a set. Yes, there we go. There you go. D1. Cracked off the rook, and now Short has six pawns. Kasparov, only five pawns. Can Short win? I mean, he's a, he's a pawn up. He's, he's surprised Kasparov. Kasparov couldn't have taken on e5 with his L bishop. Look at the world champion. He looks desperate. Kasparov recovered from what was a nasty position, forcing Short to offer a draw. The champion was happy to accept. Kasparov looking unsettled, but still with a tremendous five-point cushion. The score after 17 games, 11 points to six. We are playing World Chess Championship match, and my ultimate goal is here just to score 12 and a half points, and I don't mind how it goes. I win just today, or in, in, in two days, or in four days. Uh, it it's, you know, definitely was quite unpleasant, you know, just to lose the position where I just I could get a draw probably by offering it at one point. Kasparov definitely happy with the result there, with the outcome of game 17. Ray, what are we going to look at here? Well, this is the position for Kasparov's 20th move. And in fact, Kasparov played this move, Bishop F4. And after the game, he told me he wasn't happy with this move at all. So let's take that back. Mm -hmm. Now, there's been an ongoing debate between Kasparov and Short about double pawns. Short has all these pawn weaknesses, double pawns here, double pawns here. And Kasparov believes that these pawns should be exploitable. So far, he's found to do it. But he thought afterwards that this might be the right way to do it. Rook here. Mm -hmm. And then Short would take it off. Check. Bishop takes back. Then black brings the king up. The bishop comes back into an active position. Rook comes across, king over, rook here. This is all Kasparov's analysis after the game mm -hmm. that he showed me. Bishop here, the rook has to move across. This is similar to the game in some ways, but now you get rid of an exchange of this very dangerous bishop, the one that gave Kasparov such a horrible shock during yes. the game, sacrificing itself. Takes back. And now white takes the open file. The rook comes across to round up this pawn. 
and after this move, takes, takes, rook takes pawn here, and f4, eventually you chase away the knight, and the white rook will come sailing into the black position along here, and attack the wheat pawns over here. So Kasparov thought that by doing that, by trading off the rooks, he might have kept some advantage and avoided this horrible, shocking bishop sacrifice, the sudden transfer of diocese that occurred in the game, <laughs> and really almost blew him out of the water. It really did. He started mumbling, didn't it he, a lot? Yes. Almost fell off his chair. Absolutely. All right. Thanks for the time being, Ray. Now, we've been joined in the studio by the under-14 girls world chess champion, Ruth Sheldon, and also Daniel King, Grandmaster Daniel King. Now, Ruth, is it difficult for a girl to play chess in terms of uh, antagonism that you might get? Well, yeah, when I was younger, I um, got a lot of teasing before people knew who I was. Um, once a boy's father told me that the reason that I'd beaten his son was because I fluttered my eyelashes at him. Did you honestly believe that? How old were you at the time? Um, I must have been about nine. Nine years old and he yeah. accused you of a, a bit of sex? And I don't believe it. Do you think it's good, Ruth, that, that, I mean, you're the world champion in the girls' section. Do you think it's good to have separate competitions for the girls and the boys? Um, well, ideally, no, but um, the reason they do it at the moment is because there are so few girls playing that they're um, generally weaker than the boys. So um, um, if they um, put them together, yeah. then the though it would just be boys playing, really, because the girls wouldn't get a chance to represent the country. So you need to coach and bring on the girls yeah. as a separate yeah. entity. But the Polgar sisters, Judith Polgar, who's the world's uh, youngest ever grandmaster, isn't she? She was uh, 16 yeah. when she became grandmaster. Um, hero of yours? Definitely. I think yeah. she's done really well. She's proved that women can play chess. Now, she wouldn't play in, in girls' competitions, would she, Ruth? Is that right? Um, I don't think so. I think because um, male competitions are often stronger, so she probably wanted to improve her chess that way. Do you have an ambition to become a grandmaster? Um, yeah, I'd definitely like to when I'm older. Now, how much older? I don't know. I just want to take it as it comes and see what happens. Now, how often, uh, Dan, should somebody of Ruth's age, Ruth, you're 13 now, aren't you? How often should they be playing chess? Really? Well, as much as possible. The more you play, the more you learn, the greater experience you can, you can gain. Um, I'd say, I don't know, is it possible to, to say uh, once every couple of weeks? I don't know, as much as you feel is, is right for you. I don't think there's and you're any happy to do it. I yes, exactly. There's no hard and fast rule. I don't think you should say you should play every week or something like that. I, mean, I remember when I was Ruth's age, I was playing for every weekend for maybe a month, and then I wouldn't play for two months at all. Mm. Is but it becoming a young person's game, Daniel? I mean, definitely. are you get, getting too old for this? Now? Yeah, I've got a few grey hairs, I tell you. <laughs> I'm getting like Kasparov. Um, <laughs> you need to be very fit, physically and mentally, to play chess, and the younger you are, the better. Ruth, do you want to be a professional chess player? Um, at the moment, I don't think so, but... I mean, as long as I enjoy the game, I just like to sort of see what happens when I'm older. I'm not going to make any decisions. Well, we wish you all the very best of luck in the future. Thank Thanks you for coming in. From world champions now to something for we lesser mortals, let's hear from Mike Fox again with another chess tale. With me is the complete chess addict, Mike Fox. Now, today we're going to talk about postal chess. Postal chess, yes. It's um, much more relaxed than the stuff you've been watching between Kasparov and Short. There are no clocks there to worry you. You're all by yourself in the quiet of your own home. You just wait for the move to arrive through the post and then take a day, maybe, to think about it, consult reference books if you wish, and send it back. Here's a game, for example, I'm playing right now against Patrick Moore. I'm losing it, I'm afraid. <laughs> so at that, at that pace of game, you expect no blunders to be made. But watch this. Here's a postal game that was played back in the 40s uh, between an English vicar and a chap who is, uh, we'll call, anonymous. Um, and uh, Mr. Anonymous played E4. C5. That's an opening that um, Danny King was demonstrating, the Sicilian defence, yes. uh, you may recall. Looking good so far. Looking good so far. Very good, yes. Knight to E2. Slightly unusual um, by Mr. Anonymous. And now... The vicar brings his knight out to there, where it can be attacked by the pawn, and it is. So the knight comes here to a nice central square. Well, why not hit the knight again? So white played there, and on goes the knight. 
And it's at this point that um, Mr. Anonymous played the move that got him into the record books as the shortest ever postal game, for he played the appalling, after a whole day's thought, night there. And Carol, I'm sure you can see the winning move. Yes. It's night in there, check and mate. Because the king is totally trapped. Can't move. <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> Well, after the break, Nigel Short's big chance yesterday in Game 18. More from Ray Keane and also from Daniel King. See you then. After a wonderful week so far for Nigel Short, Saturday dawned with high expectations in everybody's minds. Could Short do it again with White while he had the champion on the ropes? Interestingly, the opening was identical to Tuesday's game until move 10 when Kasparov varied. But still, Nigel Short came out of the opening with a slight advantage. The middle game, however, involved a little time-wasting on the board by Nigel. So let's join the game now with Kasparov about to make his 25th move. It seems to me that Short's wasted a bit too much time. He's let Kasparov break open the centre with the move pulled to d5. And... Kasparov actually seems to have the initiative in the middle of the board. I don't like this at all. I think that some of Nigel's moves were far too time-wasting, dilatory. Um, Nigel's been moving his bishop backwards and forwards. And now it's been traded off. I suppose the knight can take back and go into a strong position. Yeah, but I agree. I think uh, Nigel lost the thread a bit. I think it was a mistake to allow Kasparov to break open the position by playing his pawn into d5. Oh, that's a very strong one. Knight d4, that knight can't be shifted. Knight coming to a powerful square in the centre of the board and also opening up the line of the rook attacking the knight. Nigel, so Nigel's I'm going imagine, to play knight takes bishop now. Yes, I think he must take that bishop now. And if Kasparov just recaptures with his pawn, he's going to have strength in his pawn centre and Nigel's got the problem of what to do with the black knight on d4, which is really hard to challenge. I, I, I'm beginning to dislike this intensely for White. Indeed, I think Kasparov has this fantastic pawn centre which is a great worry. So let's take a look at knight takes e6, which I think is obligatory. All right, knight takes e6. And probably Kasparov will take back with the pawn. f7 takes e6. Right. Short, short's done it. He's done it, yes. And now Kasparov sure to play pawn takes knight. I don't see uh, Should, anything more that at yeah. all. Pawn takes knight, just strengthening his center, leaving him with two lovely strong center pawns there, and this lovely knight in the centre of the board. A giant knight on, on d4. He has great pressure down on this pawn. There we go. Take on an e6. Don't like this for white. So, queen's gone to a8, which wasn't what we were expecting. The white knight is attacked <coughs> on a5. Nigel's got two choices. Queen to b6, defending the knight. Or knight to b3, which he's played. No, I think queen b6 was too risky. Looked I think, terribly dangerous. I think uh, rook, rook to b8 should should Not the queen off the knight, probably win the knight. Yeah. And now Kasparov's going to have to play queen takes pawn on a4. So after he recaptures the pawn, he re-establishes material parity. And white's and left with that weak pawn on c2. Yeah, so this is Short's big problem in the position. The weak pawn on c2, there he goes. Re Snapped it off. Recaptures the pawn. It's this pawn on c2. It can't advance because... As far as pawn on b4 clamps it, so the pawn on c2, a permanent weakness on this open file, and Kasparov still has this lovely pawn centre. I wonder whether Nigel shouldn't, I mean, his position is looking dangerous, and Black's got these wonderful pawns on e5 and d5 as well. Maybe he should just take time and play a move like h3, just to, I used to play rook a1 rook as a king a1. queen. I rather like h3, just to make a, some, some space for his king so that there are no back rank h3, uh-huh. Well, I don't think he needs to yet. Well, let's see. Where's, I, I imagine Kasparov will... Queen c6. Absolutely. Queen's attacked. Yeah. Play queen c6, just Without attacking the pawn on c2. That pawn on c2 is so weak, he's bound to do that. And I think Nigel's going to have to, his work cut out to draw this position. All, the, all the pluses are on Kasparov's side here. <coughs> Clock ticking. Neither side in serious time pressure. Kasparov, roughly half an hour left, so not serious time pressure. Short, just over a quarter of an hour. A little less time, but nothing too serious. It's interesting the way they sit at the board. Nigel tends to lean over, and Kasparov is bolt upright. 
may also be a function of the chairs they're using, which are quite different. But certainly Nigel on defensive now. So whether he can hold it, that's the question. Queen back to C6, yes. Little doubt about that. And what's he, what's he played? So Short just defending the pawn on C2 there, just holding his position. After that succession of exchanges, Short had lost his advantage and looked relieved to accept a draw after Kasparov's 33rd move. Kasparov is now on the edge of victory, just one point away from winning the championship and the purse of over one million pounds. With some luck, I mean, I could uh, uh, retain the title just by the end of this week, by just not having all this stupid moves in the game 16, but, uh, you know, I'm getting closer, and that's a half white piece in game 19, and uh, who knows, maybe I just can finish it in just one game. <laughs> Do you think, Nigel? Well, I uh, have a different opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he does have a very different opinion. Do you think, Ray, that Nigel threw that game away? No, he was never winning, but he was white, and he did seem to me to have a promising position when it started. And I'd hope that he would, well, at the very least, put more pressure on Kasparov before giving the draw. OK, well, let's have a look at the analysis now. Well, this is the position where they agreed a draw. Mm -hmm. And I was a bit surprised they agreed a draw, because it looks to me as if White's under some pressure. In particular, this pawn on C2 is under a clamp. Yes. If ever it pushes forwards, for example, apart from it can be taken anyway, there's always two, no less than two, what we call en passant captures. Mm -hmm. So this pawn on C2, if he goes forwards, can be taken either way. It's completely clamped, and there's no way of, of freeing the position. And then suddenly they interrupted their cogitations and agreed a draw. But it was only after Short, at the end of the game, showed this move Rookie one. that yeah. makes the draw. It goes like this. And then we have an exchange here, an exchange, an exchange here. And this is how the draw would have come about. But we would normally, perhaps as an earlier phase of the match, expected them to play this variation out. Rook takes, now you win the knight, but then you come here, threatening the knight and this check. You have to move the pawn up. You take this off, take that. It's a dead draw, but earlier in the match, instead of interrupting their thought process and just stopping, they would have played this out and proved it for the public. OK, thanks, Ray. Well, let's join Daniel King now for one of his grandmaster classes, this time explaining what uh, Ray has just mentioned, the en passant rule. In the 16th century, two exceptional moves were introduced that made the game more dynamic, which reflected the spirit of the Renaissance age. One of them is the en passant capture. If, for instance, in this position, black moved his pawn up to the fifth rank, and white moved the pawn up two squares, then black may capture that pawn by moving the pawn behind it, and you take the pawn away. It's just as if the pawn had only moved one square and, you, and then you capture it. If black is going to capture the pawn en passant, then he must do it on the move immediately following that. It's no use making one move, white making another, and then thinking you can capture. You can't. If you're going to capture en passant, you must exercise your option immediately after the move has been made. So let's just look at it again. Pawn moves two squares and you capture en passant. Ray Keen, I know that uh, Kasparov is just one point away from victory now, but Nigel has proved that Kasparov is not invincible, has he not? Kasparov is not invincible, but he is, in my opinion, the greatest champion chess has ever seen. I mean, he's a fantastic player. Because this was his first loss for 18 months, wasn't it? It was, yes. I mean, Kasparov, very, for someone who plays such risky, aggressive chess, he loses very rarely. Tony, any advice to anyone who's trying to conquer that fear of the invincibility of their opponent? Yes, focus on what you're doing, not the opponent. If you focus on, this is the amazing, then you lose. Okay. You have to focus on the goal. Now, Ruth Sheldon uh, was on earlier in the programme. Do you think that there is a sort of a mental difference in attitude between girls and boys of Ruth's age? No, I don't. I mean, what's interesting is there's a sudden burst of young girls becoming dominant in mental sports. You have uh, Polgar, obviously, in chess, Grandmaster 15. Mm -hmm. Natasha Dio, World Women's Memory Champion, 16. You have Ruth, obviously, 
You've got Lana Israel, top science student in the world at 16. So there's this tremendous upsurge. I don't think there's an enormous difference at all. Just Do a matter of how we use it. it it's not trained. tokenism, though. You don't think it's just one girl who's making it in a particular Not field. at all. I mean, it's all kinds of girls. It's all these different girls. You've got the Polgar sisters. There's, there's a massive rise of awareness that women have massive intelligence. It's the same as men. Okay. Now, Ray, is this match going to end on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, the last week? What's your prediction? Well, the mo most likely prognosis, given the run of the recent games, is that it will be a draw on Tuesday and a draw on Thursday, and that will give Kasparov his winning margin of 12.5 points. But I do know that Kasparov is very determined. He feels he hasn't really given of his best in the last few games. He wants to bang Nigel over the head on Tuesday. He really wants to kill him. And if he goes into the game with that attitude, maybe Nigel's got a chance of a counterattack. What do you think, Tony? Yes, I think it'll probably be, be a draw, but Nigel was very confident, so I think one of them could get <laughs> a major victory. All right, then. Well, thank you very much, Tony and Ray. We'll see you on Tuesday, uh, Ray. And finally, thank you to everybody who's entered our competition. We've had literally thousands of entries. We'll announce the winners on Tuesday. We'll be back on Tuesday, game 19, Kasparov playing white back at 3.30, 8 o'clock, and with the late night show. See you then. This is surely time. Arik Kasparov's result. Yes. Uh, it's a relief. A relief. <laughs> More than that, surely. I think it's uh, not before time. <laughs>